and welcome to today's lecture on Archaic Greece. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to go back to the time period in ancient Greece where we start to see the origins of what we associate with being Greece, right? The things that make Greece Greece, they almost all happen during the Archaic. So let's take a look at what we'll see. We're going to start with a recap of the 8th century Renaissance, that first period where Greece is emerging from the Dark Ages and starting down this path uh, towards what makes Greece so influential. From there, we're going we're gonna to think a little bit about how Greece uh, uniquely, at this point in time in the ancient world, is moving towards equality. This is a very strange thing when it comes to ancient civilizations. From there, we'll talk about some of the things that are going on culturally in that period. And finally, we'll wrap up with a few concluding thoughts. So the 8th century Renaissance, where are we, right? So we're through the Bronze Age, 2,000 years nearly of uh, complexity, monumental arch architecture, uh, social and economic hierarchies, that sort of thing. After that collapses, we move into the Dark Ages, 400 plus years where those types of uh, hierarchies and complexity end up kind of collapsing, and we get very basic settlements, uh, very kind of basic forms of material culture. And then in the 8th century, we see the, the, the kind of culture rising from the ashes. All of a sudden, right, we had this kind of beautiful iconographic um, uh, pottery in the Bronze Age. We moved to this very basic geometric pottery during the Dark Ages, and now iconography is back. So we have these depictions of funerals and people and animals and chariots and soldiers uh, decorating the pottery. And while it still looks very, very geometric, we see the start of what's moving towards that kind of Athenian pottery that we all recognize. We also get the origins of colonization. So here we've got the homeland of, of Greece, right? Uh, the Greek mainland, the island of Crete, uh, the west coast of modern day Turkey, and all the islands in between that kind of makes up the Greek homeland. But now they've set sail into the Black Sea, into southern Italy and Sicily, into what's France and Spain today. And they're building colonies there, uh, setting up Greek outposts and, and making that Greek culture um, go all the way across the Mediterranean world. So, what's going on as we get in uh, to the, uh, the, the Archaic period? Well, the Archaic period starts in that kind of 8th century, and it lasts for nearly 300 years. Now, here's the kind of issue, right? When we think of Archaic, when we say Archaic Greece, this is usually the conception that comes to mind. The word Archaic itself seems to kind of recall some very, very primitive period. But the thing is, when we think about archaic Greece, this is the time period that starts all those things that we associate with Greek culture. So when we think of this classical Athenian style of vase painting, that begins in the archaic. When we think of giant stone temples, right, columns all around it, that starts in the archaic. Even democracy, right? When we think of Greek democracy, that starts in the Archaic period. So nearly everything that we associate with Archaic Greece is starting not in the classical period. That's kind of when it reaches its peak. It starts back in the Archaic, beginning in the 8th century, the 700s BC, and going to the early 5th century BC. So one of the things that marks this period, one of the reasons this period is so important is because we see the origins uh, where Greek society starts to move slowly towards this idea of equality. And this is something that's very, very strange in the ancient world. Now, when we talk about equality, right, let's not get carried away here, all right? Uh, when we talk about equality in the ancient Greek world, what we mean is male citizens are treated equally, kind of regardless of wealth, right? But male citizens, well, they're still kind of uh, ahead of like young men, right, who are not quite of age. Uh, those male children are still ahead of like women uh, and foreigners. Everybody's ahead of slaves. It's still a huge slave society in the ancient Greek world. So we're talking about equality, right? Uh, and that's one of the things that makes ancient Greece so important. But let's not get too carried away here. This is equality with, with very kind of specific boundaries on it. Now, 
One of the things that we see is that politically, we see a weakening of power, right? More distribution of power to a larger number of people. So when we start in the Bronze Age, we have these great kings, the Wanakes, right? And they're ruling from palaces at sites like Gnosis and Mycenae. As we move into the Dark Ages, the, the term that we associate with kingship is Basileus, right? Or Vasileus. And uh, this is what kind of the kings of the Iliad and the Odyssey were, these kind of weaker period um, of kings. And by the Archaic period, by the 8th century, we don't have too many kings at all. Instead, what we have are oligarchies, this idea of the rule of the few. And so in this period, right, we're seeing the slow dispersal of power to a larger number of people. Now, what I want to talk about for a while is why this happens, right? This is very, very uh, unusual in the ancient world. So what is it about Greece that makes people give power to a larger number of people? What pushes them towards this idea of social and political equality? Well, there are three main reasons. And the first one here is that Greece, compared with other civilizations of the same time period, is fairly uh, less dispersed in terms of the distribution of wealth. And what I mean by that is that the division between rich and poor, while it still exists, for sure exists, is less dramatic than in places like the Near East. And one of the things that we have, one of the good stories that we have uh, to kind of exemplify this, comes from the historian Herodotus. And he's talking about uh, a Greek citizen who's so wealthy that he's able to, um, he's got like five or six talents, right? And talent is a, a measure, a weight measure of silver. Five or six is quite a lot of it. And that's enough to build a trireme, that's an ancient Greek ship, to furnish it with people to sail it, and to sail the thing for a year. And Herodotus is like blown away that, that this, this one Greek citizen has five or six talents, has enough money to do that. Now, to give you some context, at the same time that this guy uh, is building, has enough uh, silver to build this ship, if we look towards the Near East, towards the Persian Empire that's going on at this period, we've got a private citizen, right? Not the king, right? Just a regular private citizen, one of the aristocracy. He's got like 18,000 talents of silver, all right? So three or four times what this Greek dude had, and that's just a private citizen, not anybody um, in the, the royal family. And so what we see is monetarily that distribution of wealth is a little bit um, less dispersed, right? Less divided in the Greek world than it is in the Near East. Our next reason that Greece ends up pushing towards equality is that they've developed this new style of warfare. And what you're looking at here is something known as the Kiji vase, right? It's kind of a weird pronunciation. It doesn't look like it's spelled. That's the Italian pronunciation. This resides in Italy today. And the Kiji vase dates to the 7th century BC. And the reason this is so important is because when we zoom in on it, we've got a new depiction of the way wars are fought. So in the Bronze Age, that's an age of heroes, right? People going, uh, going out there and engaging in uh, kind of heroic styles of one-on-one -on -one battle. What we see here is we see groups of Greek soldiers, very, very tightly packed in there, very large shields, heavily armored, spears is the main weapon, and this is what we call phalanx warfare. Now to give you a bit of background, right, the new soldiers that we have now in the archaic period, we call these hoplites. So this is a statuette from uh, around 500 BC. Hoplites tend to be very heavily armored, something like 70 pounds of armor. Uh, they have a huge shield, um, and the way that the shield is set up is this thing is so big, right, that, uh, that it covers half of your own body, but half of the body of the person next to you. And so what you end up doing when you're this heavily armored, you have a very long spear, and you have a shield that covers you and your neighbor, is that you get very tightly packed, you hide behind those shields, you stick those spears way out in front of you, and then you just march slowly towards the enemy, pointing them, well, you know, poking them with the pointy end of the, uh, the spear. And this is what we call phalanx warfare. And the reason this kind of brings us back towards equality is this very much discourages any type of isolated heroism. This works extremely well when everybody does the exact same thing, right? Everybody's dressed the same way, 
the same type of armor, the same weapon, moving in unison. And so now all of a sudden, kind of everybody's the same rather than having that individual hero like Achilles that we get during the Bronze Age. The third reason that we're moving towards equality here is this unique conception uh, that the Greeks have of the gods and of religion. And so what we end up seeing is that the Greeks uh, believe that, they, that nobody can kind of hold a monopoly on the gods, right? On their relationship with the gods. And so what that means is at any point in time, any Greek citizen can go make a sacrifice to one of the gods. And while that might seem kind of normal now, like why wouldn't somebody be able to do that? In other parts of the ancient world, this is much more controlled. So when Herodotus, right, the historian, goes out to the east and into the Persian Empire, he's kind of mystified by the fact that regular people can't make sacrifices. You have to go to a priest. And when the government, right, when the, the monarch controls the priesthood, uh, he kind of controls religion. And um, so that's going on in the Persian Empire in the Near East. Whereas in Greece, anybody can do this at any point in time, which means the political leaders can't necessarily control the religion. So those are some of the reasons that we see um, a move towards equality in the ancient Greek world. So let's now think a little bit about what's going on culturally during the Archaic period. So one of the things that's going on are we getting all kinds of intellectual developments. Now, it's not like there were no intellectual developments before. We actually have quite a lot, right? So the Egyptians have a 365-day calendar. Mesopotamians kind of have understood the, uh, the motion of the planets. Uh, different cultures have developed the decimal system. We don't really get that in the Roman Empire uh, or in the Greek world yet because of the, the way that they construct their numbers. Uh, but different groups have got algebra and geometry, so there's quite a lot going on already. But within the Greek world, we start to get uh, a philosophical movement towards understanding the way the natural world, world works. And what we call this is we call this the Ionian Enlightenment. Now, Ionia, if we remember, is a, a region of the Greek world that we correlate now with Western Turkey. Right? This is also actually where Homer's from. And what we have here is we have a group of people who start asking questions, uh, not so much how does something work, but why does it work, right? So they want to explain what they see in the world, and they want to do so in a new kind of way. So first of all, they want to do so by removing the gods, right? So you can still have gods, you can still worship them, but they want to come up with explanations for natural phenomena that don't involve the gods. They also want knowledge that can move across systems, right? So something that works in one sphere also works in another sphere, right? It explains multiple different types of phenomena. And we call these guys, right, uh, the Ionian philosophers. Um, a good number of them are from the site of Miletus. Some of the early ones are Thales uh, and Anaximander and Anaximenes and Anaxagoras and Xenophanes, all right? And so what they start to do is they start to come up with ideas about what they think makes up the world and makes the world work the way it does. And they tend to focus on different types of elements. So like one of them would say that at its core, right, everything is some version of water, right? Whether it's in liquid form, in solid form like ice, right? In gas form like steam. Another guy thinks that it's fire. Everything is fire at the core. And so while they weren't technically right about kind of what makes up everything, uh, they were asking the types of questions that go beyond these kind of religious explanations for phenomena, right? Starting to think, why does lightning occur? Maybe not because Zeus throws lightning bolts, right? Uh, but because uh, there's some sort of reaction that's occurring. We also get huge developments uh, in material culture at this time. So one of the things that we see is we get this move towards lifelike, kind of life-size uh, sculpture. And so one of the things that you can notice over here with these uh, four sculptures on the right-hand side, these are all Greek, and over here on the left-hand side, we have an uh, Old Kingdom um, sculpture from Egypt. And so you can see the Greeks borrowing this kind of uh, style of sculpture. 
And you'll notice that when this picks up in Greece, in the, the kind of middle of the 7th century BC, this is the exact time when Greece has set up its first colony in Egypt. So they set up a colony there, they're exposed to this sort of sculpture, and then they start to adopt that for themselves. And during the Archaic period, uh, we get two kind of prototypical types of Greek sculpture uh, in the human form. The male version we call the koros, K-O-U-R-O-S, and the female version over here, uh, we call it the kore, so K-O-R-E. Um, and what we see is as things move kind of later in time, what we end up getting is a move away from the kind of super stiff posture, right? Rigid form, arms by the side, one foot forward, right? More towards something that becomes a little bit more lifelike. Uh, and this guy at the end, we call him the Critios boy. This is like the kind of missing link sculpture between the archaic sculpture that we see here and what we'll get into in the classical period where things look extremely fluid and lifelike. We also get the development of temples the way we kind of think of Greek temples during the Archaic period. So we saw the very, very start of this in the 8th century uh, with this little model of what uh, a temple looks like from the 700s, um, a temple of Hera uh, at the site of Argos. But later on in the Archaic period, by the middle of the 6th century BC, they are building massive stone temples with the kind of uh, iconic columns that go all the way around the temple. Uh, these are Greek temples the way we think of Greek temples. And once again, while this might be perfected in the classical period with something like the Parthenon, we get the first ones of these during the Archaic period in Greece. Now, a little primer on temples, right? Just so that when you go to Greece or you go to southern Italy or Sicily, you can identify the order and date of these kind of temples. Uh, there are three different orders of Greek temples, and we call those Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. And there are a lot of different characteristics of each one of those, but the easiest way to tell the difference is all, uh, like by looking at the capital, all right? And the capital is the thing that sits right above the column uh, that attaches kind of the column to the upper triangular part of the temple. Now, in a Doric uh, style of architecture, we get a very simple capital, all right? So it's kind of a bowl-shaped capital, very, very plain. If you see that, uh, that's going to be Doric architecture. The column also sits directly on the, the platform here. With Ionic temples, you get the scroll-shaped things, right? We call those volutes, right? That's the architectural term for them. And so if you see those scrolls, those volutes on top of the capitals, uh, that's an Ionic form of uh, architecture. And we also start to get a base for the columns um, that then sits on the platform itself. Corinthian architecture is the latest version of architecture, right? The most kind of recent version. And there you get the most kind of fanciest floral designs. So if you see something kind of very complicated and fancy on top of the column, that's a good, that's a good sign that it's Corinthian in style and fairly late in terms of date. When you look at the plan of a temple, all right? So we're looking at kind of a top-down view. They tend to have uh, three major kind of components, all right? So uh, you have this kind of vestibule out front. We call this the pronous. This is kind of the entryway to the, uh, the Holy of Holies, which in Latin we call the cella. In Greek, we call the nous. And that's the sanctuary. This is literally where the god lives. All right? So there's a cult statue uh, in here. This is the house of the god. And then in the back, this little room that faces the other way, this is what we call the opisthodomos. All right? Say that three times fast. The opisthodomos. And this is essentially the treasury. So one of the things that happens is when people come to these temples, especially if they've made a pilgrimage from far away, they bring some gift for the god, all right? A votive statue, a bronze tripod, something of that nature. And these things would get stored up in the treasury back here until that got filled up, and then they'd usually get buried somewhere. Um, and uh, so that's where the gifts to the god lives. Then we've got the columns around the outside. It stands on a platform as well. And that's the basic plan, right? This changes from temple to temple, but this is essentially the basic plan. Entryway, house of the god itself, treasury in the back. And one of the things that city-states would do is they would start building not just one temple to their favorite god, they would start using temples as a way to kind of compete with other city-states, right? Remember, these are individually governed city-states. And so they're competing for prestige 
with other city-states. And one of the ways they do that is by building temple after temple after temple. And this is especially true in southern Italy and in Sicily. So here in the site, at the site of Selenunte, right, you can see one of the large temples here, another large temple right next to it, not in as good of a shape, and then another large temple way up there, again, uh, kind of in ruins right now, um, but three massive temples all right next to each other. And we see the same thing when we move into southern Italy. So this is the site of Pestum, uh, down south of uh, modern-day Naples. Again, we can see massive temple here, another temple right here. And if you look in the distance, there's a, a third massive temple um, up there uh, to that side of the site. And another site in Sicily, the site of Agrigento. Um, and again, right, if we're seeing a temple, we got one way up there, we've got another guy here, one over here, there's mains of one down here. Uh, these would have, you know, half dozen, maybe more temples, all at huge expense to the city, but that's one way that they gained prestige within the Greek community. And then we can look at pottery as well, right? So this is what we call Proto-Corinthian pottery, right? So from the site of Corinth, it begins with this kind of geometric look, uh, in a heavy, heavy kind of Near Eastern influence. And this eventually evolves into what we call the Corinthian style of pottery in the late 7th century, early 6th century BC. And what we're looking at here is it tends to be different kind of faunal designs, right? Lions are a big part of Corinthian style pottery. Uh, again, they kind of have a Near Eastern look, and it's kind of almost a mix, mixture between iconography and geometry with the, the iconography um, having a heavy dose of geometric uh, kind of um, sense to it. Now that's going on in Corinth, but what we see start going on in Athens is the development of what we call Athenian black figure pottery, right? When we think of Greek pottery, this is what we think of, uh, and this begins in the early 500s in Athens, all right? So this is a picture of Ajax and Achilles uh, playing dice, right, and a little kind of a break uh, moment from the uh, Trojan War here. Uh, but this starts, even though this is what we think of as classical pottery, this starts in the Archaic period. And that eventually develops from black figure, because the figures are black, to what we call Athenian red figure pottery, right? Maybe not the most creative name, but here we can see um, the, uh, the figures in red, um, again, given that very classical look. And this starts uh, even before the classical period starts, the early part of the 5th century BC. And we can look at these, and we can look at the evolution, right? Corinthian pottery uh, evolving from this to something like this. Athenian pottery moving from black figure to red figure. This is also how you can date it. So if you ever go to a museum and see these, if you see the, the figures in black, you say, oh, that's probably 6th century BC. If you see the figures in red, you say, ah, 5th century BC, for sure. So let's wrap up with a couple concluding thoughts. So. Looking into the Archaic period, we see the development of all the things that we associate with classical Greece. And while they may reach their pinnacle in the classical period, they develop during the Archaic. So things like equality, right, uh, caused by distribution of wealth, this new style of hoplite and phalanx warfare, uh, this kind of Greek sense of ideology where anybody can worship the gods. Uh, we see this kind of uh, philosophical movement where people start asking, right, uh, how the world works and why it works the way it does. So we're not to Socrates yet, but we get people asking those types of questions. We see the development of stone temple architecture, right? When we think of a Greek temple, that concept comes about during the Archaic period. And the same thing for Greek pottery as well. When we kind of have that conception, what we're thinking about is something that developed uh, in the 6th century in the Archaic period in Greece. And finally, the same thing with sculpture. While things get much more fluid over time, this idea of life-size human sculpture depicting the human body in stone begins during the Archaic. So, uh, if you take away kind of one thing here, right, is that while things may uh, reach their, their pinnacle later on, uh, it all begins in Archaic Greece. <laughs>